everyone to ChessLecture.com. This is International Master Bill Pascal with another chess video presentation. Today my topic will be the advantage of a central pawn majority. When I'm talking about a central pawn majority, that means pawns within the C, D, E, and F lines. I define these four files. The central, D, and E, the, the true pure center, but also the C and F, I would count as central files, and pawns on those files would be central pawns. So these four can count as central pawns. The more pawns you have inside those four lines, the more powerful your central majority. I mean, you're probably going to have a majority if you have all four pawns there, or more than four pawns, possibly if you have doubled pawns. We're going to look at a game where this actually is a very important factor. Queen pawn game, d4, the first move, played by Mark Taimanov, very famous Soviet grandmaster, one of the challengers of Bobby Fischer before his, his reign as world champion, one of the strongest players in the world for many, many years. Taimanov, fantastic positional player, fantastic all-around player, was in the top ten in the world for many years. Knight f6, the response from his opponent, Abramov. So it's Taimanov versus Abramov, and this game is from the Soviet Union, 1950. C4, E6, and now knight to C3, bishop to B4, the Nimzo-Indian defense, or Nimzovich defense, as it's called in some older texts. They stopped calling this particular variant the Nimzovich because it's too cheap to name. There are actually several openings that Nimzovich himself uh, used, and uh, narr narrowing it down to the Nimzo-Indian because an Indian defense occurs after d4, c4, knight f6, e6. This is a Nimzo Indian with bishop to b4. And now this is a move that I don't personally think is a very flexible move, but it's still played by some specialists. a3. You would think that this move would be kind of a waste of time, forcing black to make this exchange that he's threatening to make anyway. But some players believe so strongly in the power of the white center that they play a3, so-called Samish variation, directly. So after a3, bishop takes c3, b takes c3. Look what's happened to the pawn formation. A lot of people think of this only in terms of it being beneficial for black, the doubled pawns. Doubled pawns can become weaknesses because they aren't easy to protect, for example, here there's no B pawn to protect that C pawn at C3. But the pawns have an offensive and useful side, too. Here, it's one more pawn in the central zone. So now white has five pawns. If you count all the pawns on the C, D, E, and F files, white has five pawns instead of four. And this is potentially a big advantage in terms of central control. If those pawns can just blood over black in advance freely, black pieces would be driven away from the center and white would have great opportunities for an attack. Black's goal is to stop the pawns from freely advancing. Now here, my favorite move, and the one I recommend to my students for black, is C5, Nimzovich's primary idea, which is to, to fix the pawns, the double pawns, so they don't undouble. By playing c5, you would fix the pawns at c4 and, and c3. There are other ways to play. Black can play b6 and not commit his central pawns right away. Black in the game played d5. This is my least favorite move for black because it'll, it allows white to exchange off one of his doubled pawns. To me, this is kind of paradoxical. We've just inflicted double pawns, and here we're going to let them exchange them off. So what real compensation do we have for having exchanged a bishop for a knight early on? One could argue that black has a slight lead in development. 
but really it's so slight it's almost insignificant. And allowing the pawns to undouble gives away what could be a static or long-term advantage for black. So d5, c takes d5. Now here, if the knight takes back, the knight will always be potentially attacked by pawns advancing. It's much more solid to take back with a pawn which was played. Now still, the ratio of pawns in the center from one side against the other, from that perspective, has not changed. I mean, white still, the ratio is slightly different, true, but my point is, it's still one more pawn in the center for white. So four against three instead of five against four. But they're healthier pawns for white now, four completely healthy pawns against three healthy pawns. And another thing here that's happening is, this last move splits black's pawns into distinct islands. So we have this one island here, that I've drawn an arrow across the F7, G7, H7, and then the other island is the A7, B7, C7, D5 island. White has two islands too, but he has a longer and bigger island. H2 to E2 and D4 and C3 all consist in one island. Bigger pawn islands are generally better because it's harder to get at the base of those pawns and attack them. So white has a better pawn structure and he has a central majority. These are very small positional factors that have to be, you know, used in conjunction with every other important fundamental rule in chess. So now, e takes d5, e3 may look strange to block in the bishop on c1, but white wants to get his kingside development underway. Plus, the bishop on c1 occasionally can be seen coming out to a3. There are lines where white plays a4. You also see this in the winnower variation of the French sometimes. The bishop can come out to a3 and, and influence this empty dark diagonal. So e3 castle, bishop to d3. And after bishop to d3, now we're looking at the position. Basically, white has prepared his king's king side formation. Bishop d3, now the knight will probably go to e2. And the reason you want it to go to e2, so you don't get in the way of your fourth central pawn on the f-file. And you're going to see the plan now. So bishop d3, rook e8, black influencing the center as much as he can, controlling e4 as much as he can. This becomes the central focus of the game, e4. Rook e8, knight to e2. And now here, I think the, black, the best plan for black, perhaps even prior to playing rook e8, is to play b6, followed by bishop a6, trying to trade off white's good bishop. But this plan has also encountered troubles. I mean, white can always avoid that exchange by backing his own bishop up to c2. There's no guarantee black is going to get or force an exchange of those, those bishops. Instead, he played knight on b to d7, where the knight has potentially for, for f8, trying to regroup, like in the queen's gambit declined. Castles, knight f8, and now finally f3. And this is part of the plan, the classic plan when you have a central pawn majority. If white can get an e4, everything starts to go downhill for black. If you get an e4, you liberate your bishop at c1. You're gaining space. You're going to be able to push e5 very easily once you get an e4. And e5 would start to drive back pieces that defend the black king side, like the knight on f6. So generally speaking, getting an e4 is a huge gain that gives white a often a clear advantage. Now sometimes black can get in c5, himself first c5, and try to put pressure on the d4 pawn. So black's game here is to try to prevent e4 and try to put some pressure on, on d4 to hopefully try to keep white busy. So after, after this latest move, f3, knight to g6, Sometimes you see knight e6, but notice that knight e6 would get in the way along the pressure, get in the way of the pressure along the e-file. 
So here, knight g6. The knight doesn't really do a whole lot there. I can't say I'm a big fan of this plan that black has, has used. I think he should have been playing b6 and c5 on the queen side a long time ago. Knight g6, the, the piece just sort of sits there. Now, interesting ways white has to prepare this advance e4. Of course, knight g3 is going to be a, an interesting and integral part. Sometimes rook e1. Sometimes knight g3, rook on f to e1, rook a2, and the rook swings over to e2, doubling on the, on the file there. There's one more move now that's interesting. Queen e2, heading very likely to f2, where it will threaten pressure down the f file in some lines, allowing white to tactically play e4. So the knight on f6 might not be able to jump to capture at some moment on e4 if the white queen goes to f2. Well, this is like what happens. Queen e1, c5. Now, that's looking like a pawn sacrifice, but really, to take on c5 would, would totally change the character of the game. Black would easily win the pawn back with his queen or with his knight, and white would have given up his strong pawn at d4. I don't think that's really worth it. So after c5, queen f2, white continues the plan. Now black could, at some point, exchange, exchange pawns on d4. However, that leaves him with an isolated pawn at d5. So this strategic queen pawn game, this Nimzo Indian, is really all about positional play so far. Pawn structure. Queen f2, and now queen c7 from black. And now the next thing I want to mention about playing for e4 with white is that it has to be careful, very carefully prepared. Because when you play e4, not only do you have to contend with threats against d4, possible pawn exchange there, possible pawn exchange at e4, and recapture by the pawn on f3. And when you do that, now you're not going to have control over g4 anymore. So notice what black's tricky move does. Queen c7 defends f7 against those potential attacks down the f file I was talking about. It also sets up sneaky little threats against h2 based on the move knight to g4. So typically, white's going to have to play h3 at some point to keep pieces out of g4 since he won't have an f3 pawn after he goes e4, d takes e4, f takes e4. White needs to reinforce g4. This all happens when white prepares very slowly and carefully. Bishop d2, nice patient move, connecting the rooks and making sure that there's no weak points in his position. And now finally this plan was b6, and black intends perhaps to play bishop to b7. Passive piece, but inhibiting the move e4. Sure enough, knight g3 and bishop b7. The battle continues over e4. Look how everything on the board, well, not everything, but close to everything, is starting to really just butt heads at e4. This is the focal point of the game, the e4 square. If white gets in e4, black's position may just collapse. If he can't get it in, slowly black may have the upper hand. Now, bishop b7, rook on a to e1, black's move, rook on a to d8, trying to increase the pressure on d4 indirectly. So if white tries to advance e4 too soon, he'll have to watch out also for the d4 pawn. Now finally, h3, the move I was talking about, one of the last preparatory measures for playing e4, keeping knight out of g4 potentially is very, very important. There are some other reasons to sometimes play g4, excuse me, h3, g4 ideas. If the knight goes to f5, I can play g4. And all these pawns on the fifth rank may look like weaknesses, but they're like a porcupine. And they're not that far advanced. And they just control all these squares on the fourth, fourth rank that make it impossible for black pieces to go anywhere. Sometimes that's a strong plan, just to play h3 and g4. Now black played queen d6, which is a nice little trick. 
here, the threat is to win the pawn at a3. So white defends it, bishop c1. So the real point of bishop d2 was to get that a rook across. And as I explained earlier, sometimes the a rook goes rook a2, rook e2. This is a plan I've used in my own games. Now black's move, desperately on the defensive here, black's trying to stop e4. He plays rook e6 with the idea of perhaps doubling rooks on the e-file force comes to worse. White plays rook e2 anyway, preparing to do that doubling himself on the e-file. Everything preparing e4. Black's move, bishop c6. This is very, very good. Bishop c6, sometimes coming down to a4. He also wants to rule out later maybe bishop b5 by white. If, if, if black rooks go to e8, he might not want to be annoyed by a move like bishop b5. So bishop c6 seems reasonable. Rook on f to e1 from Taimanov. And now black has to admit he doesn't have a plan. He played bishop a8. So bishop c6 made some sense. But bishop a8 is a sure sign that black is simply waiting now. He could not find a constructive move. And I find it hard to believe that he, had, he didn't have a better move than bishop a8. Something there had to be better than bishop a8. But I do want to just appreciate something that Black has done on a positive note. He hasn't played, although it might be tempting for a beginner, he has never played c4. Do not do that. If you play c4, you relax the pressure against d4, which is one of your main, really, like, main advantages in a position. This discourages e4 is the fact you'll have pressure on d4 when white goes e4. If you play c4 for black, relaxing the pressure on d4, you only make it easy for white to play e4 later on. So black has really done a good job holding back and not playing c4. Now white plays knight f5, a move not directly fighting for e4, in fact, lessening his control over e4. But it's a really tremendous square for the knight, and now white can consider a kingside attack beginning with g4. I think this would be a very real plan. Black drops back with queen c7, taking the pressure off of a3, but renewing pressure against c3. So, bishop d2, completely logical response. And now finally, black doubles on the e-file, because d4 is just super protected by pawns, by the queen in f2, the knight in f5. There's no more sense in trying to put pressure on d4 for black. Now it's all or nothing trying to stop e4 directly. White goes back with knight to g3. Looks like a waiting move. Black himself could have repeated position here with rook back to d8. I might have done that just, just to be practical. Instead, he played queen to d6, another way of pressuring d4. Now, white strikes upon another strategy, and this is something you should do in closed games. Positionally rich and closed games, take your time, experiment with different maneuvers, you know, that don't change the position drastically until you find something really good. There's nothing wrong with that. Here... Taimanov is experimenting. He tried the knight on f5. Now he's going to play another plan, bishop f5. Bishop on f5, driving the rook back. Bishop f5, rook on 6 to e7. And now look what happens. e4. Now we've got to count the pieces. How many pieces does white have defending e4? Let's see, pawn on f3, bishop on f5 two rooks, and a knight. That's one, two, three, four, five. How many attackers does black have against e4? Pawn on d5, knight on f6, two rooks, and a bishop on a8. It's even. d4 is protected as well. White has enforced the move e4. So perhaps 
There was nothing black could do. E4 comes with incredible force. White has prepared everything. Everything's protected, the central pawns. One little drawback is that white's pawn at A3 wasn't protected, and this was what black was banking on, basically. He figured white was going to have to repeat moves, put the bishop back on C1. White struck immediately, sacrificing the pawn at A3 to break through in the center with the central pawn majority. And I think that he has all the compensation in the world after this. D takes E4. Of course, black exchanges. He doesn't want his bishop to be hemmed in on A8. So D takes E4, F takes E4, C takes D4, attacking A3. C takes D4. Those are hanging pawns, but very dangerous ones. Now, queen takes a3, black takes the pawn, probably expecting something like e5. The only thing is after e5, it gives black a good square for his pieces at d5. White has something else in mind. Bishop g5. Bishop g5, it's all about the king's side attack now. Bishop g5 threatening to play bishop takes f6, and then knight coming into h5. With a killer knight that almost can't be stopped from landing on f6. Well, this is pretty much how the game goes, and there's not a whole lot black can do about the damage to his pawn structure. He forces the exchange rather than allow e5 now. He plays h6, bishop takes f6, g takes f6, and knight h5 with a massive attack on the black king. Very strong attack. There's only one potential way to defend f6, which would be going back with queen d6. But this move could be dangerous as well, because we're taking on g6, and then taking on f6. And that would win the exchange. So the safest thing for black to do, since he can't protect f6, is to move either his king or his rook so as not to lose the exchange. He played in this position after knight h5, rook d8. So when he loses f6, it won't be with, with the loss of the exchange. Knight takes f6 check. Materials equal. White is left with two super strong pawns. Central pawns in the middle game are more important than wing pawns. Those wing pawns are going to take a million moves before they're a threat to come down the board and queen. But the central pawns take squares away from pieces in the vital part of the board. So in the middle game, the central pawns are stronger. And this is clearly a middle game. So knight takes f6, king h8. Now e5. e5, anchoring the knight on f6. White would love to just roll these pawns down the board. Unfortunately, that's not so easy. But the real killer here is the weakness of black's king side. This is the thing that's going to bring him down. The knight on f6 is like almost impossible to exchange off. Because even if a black knight could go back to f8 and go to d7 or h7, the white bishop is dominating it, could exchange bishop for knight instead of knight for knight. After e5, black played queen to b4, pressuring d4, perhaps making way for his a pawn. Now here white finds a nice trick to simplify the game. Bishop e4, indirectly defending d4 by attacking the bishop on a8. And also, you know, I think prudently exchanging black's most powerful attacking piece, the bishop on a8. Black's pawn structure is, is very, very bad, and his kingside is in grave danger. If white could just so, so simply attack h6 somehow, it would be basically game over. And he's right on the edge of being able to do that. All he had to do was defend d4 first. And this is an integral part of that. Bishop takes e4. Rook takes e4. Now d4 is defended. White is threatening simply to play queen e3, followed by knight g4. And black will have no way to defend h6. So black has to take some kind of measure against that. He plays rook c7 which gives him the f8 square for his queen. But I don't think this is really a good way to defend, to defend h6. 
At this point, I would think White could start immediately going for the H6 pawn. Instead, he uses a different plan, H4, to drive that knight away. One of the only protectors of the black king side could be driven to a more passive position. H4, continuing the king side attack from time enough. Now, A5, black desperately trying to see counterplay. But again, this is the nature of the middle game with central pawns versus wing pawns. The wing pawns are just very slow to push down the board. Meanwhile, the damage has been done on the king side. The central pawns are more important. So h4, a5, h5. The knight has to retreat. Knight e7. This is a little awkward because it blocks the queen from coming back to f8. But the problem is on f8, maybe f8 had to be considered. Then it was very hard in some lines to protect h6. I think with this move, knight e7, black is also thinking about knight g8 to trade that knight on f6 off. So here, that's exactly what happens. Knight g4, knight g8, defending. And now white has a nice little tactical sequence after this move. So after knight e7, knight g4, knight g8, knight takes h6 winning material, and the black position, which was really creaking, starting to creak to begin with, just comes completely unglued, because obviously after knight takes h6, queen f6 check wins the rook at d8. Black would just be done there, down the, down the exchange and a pawn for nothing. Probably still getting mated in a lot of lines, too. So you see the wrap-up of the game now. It's a pawn, but it's all the black's kingside protection gone as well. So it's just a matter of time till things just get worse. Queen e7 from black defending. Now queen f4 protecting the knight on h6 and threatening to take on g8 and invade on h6 with his queen. Queen e6 defending h6 himself. And now white makes an interesting decision. In an attacking position, keeping the pieces on, knight f5, I like this move. I like this a lot. Potentially coming to d6, which would be a great interference. Black follows that knight with knight e7. White exchanges off. Knight takes e7. Rook takes e7. Rook on 1 to e3. Time enough going for a further attack now on the g file, perhaps. King h7, rook g3, with very real threats now on the g-file. Rook on e to e8, preparing to go to perhaps g8, defending along the g-line. Now queen f3, white prepares to double rooks. Position is winning. White has to do it in a timely manner, though, because black's outside pawn could become dangerous if he was to waste too much time here. So after queen f3 threatening both rook f4 and rook g4, black gets desperate, plays f5, white plays rook f4, pressuring f5, obviously, and now there's not a lot to really be done. f5 cannot be protected for long because rook g5 is another threat. Also, note that rook g6 is dangerous as well. Black is lost here. Rook f4, rook g8, rook takes g8, king takes g8, rook takes f5, and this should be a decisive kingside attack here. Now, rook takes d4 was played, but still, it's this no protection, no pawn protection for the black king, and I think that's, that's going to be the end. Rook takes d4, rook to f6, and now black's very close to a mating net. Very, very close to a mating net. So he has to be careful where he goes. If he takes on e5, I think it's made in just two, two or three moves. So he plays queen e8, protecting against the threat of rook f8 check. Now queen g3 check, forcing the king into the corner. King h7. Queen to g5, threatening both rook h6, mate, 
as well as queen h6 check, followed by rook g6 check. Tremendous threats that cannot be defended against. And Abramov resigned in this position. This, listeners, was the ultimate textbook example of exploiting a central pawn majority. Everything steadily prepared, all the loose ends tied up, with the exception of the pawn on a3, which was a very valid pawn sacrifice for Mark Taimanov. This is an illustrative game in the best sense of the advantages of the, of the central pawn majority. Thanks, everyone. This is International Master Bill Pascal signing off from this chesslecture.com video chess presentation. Thank you.